when you focus on the breath, we want to focus as much as possible on the direct experience of the breath, how it feels directly to you. When you breathe in, where do you feel it? And to what extent does your perception of the breath, the ideas, the whole range of ideas you have about where the breath is and what it's doing, to what extent those, do those perceptions actually get in the way of directly experiencing the breath? This is one of those questions you want to keep in mind. Because the Buddha's teachings are all about how you directly experience what's going on in your mind, in your body. As he said, all he taught was stress and the end of stress. The word for stress, dukkha, can also mean suffering, pain, the whole range from the very slightest element of stress to really out and out heavy suffering. The word dukkha covers it all. And your stress that you're experiencing right now, nobody else can tap into it to know exactly how much you're experiencing or where you're experiencing it. It's something you know directly only for yourself. And even here it's possible for us, our ideas about it to get in the way, to amplify it, to minimize it, to deny it. But as much as possible, the Buddha tries to get us to look directly at it. That's the nature of all of his teachings. When he talks about dependent core rising, he's not talking about the workings of causes behind the scenes as much as he is talking about how one event in your experience corresponds with another event or accompanies another event, the things that you see happening together. And he calls the basic principle for causality this, that conditionality. In fact, it's just this, this conditionality. You see this, and you, it's connected with this right here. It's all things you're directly experiencing. This is why the evidence for how the practice works is something you, you know only for yourself. People can see the outside ramifications of the practice. In other words, the extent to which you're creating suffering for yourself inside is going to start showing in your actions. But the ultimate test is something you can know only for yourself. When they try to make scientific studies of pleasure or pain, they have no way of measuring it. They can ask you to measure it on a scale from 1 to 10, but it, that's pretty meaningless. Which means that all the numbers that they crunch around these topics start with garbage. And when you start with garbage, what do you end up with? It's just crunched garbage. Your evidence for how well the practice is working is something that you know directly. But you have to be honest with yourself. This is one of the main requirements of the teaching when the Buddha said, you know, bring me a man or bring me a person who's honest, and I will teach that person the Dharma. Someone who's honest and observant. Man, woman, child, whatever. It's the honesty and your ability to be observant. That was, that's what makes all the difference. Because it is possible to lie to yourself about the stress you're feeling on the one hand and what you're doing to cause it on the other, and unwillingness to look at these things, or if you see them, trying to cover them up. When I first came back to the States, we had to go to an Abbott's meeting, and John Sweat and myself. And on the way back, we were riding the plane, and the other person in that line of three seats probably told, could tell immediately that we were Buddhist monks just by looking at us. He'd probably heard that Buddhism talks about suffering, because just out of nowhere he turned to us and said, I don't have any suffering in my life. 
And then he proceeded to talk about his, his life. And I kept thinking, this person doesn't see that this is suffering. He, to begin with, he was living in Blythe. He had a car dealership, and he had one son in jail and another daughter who had been made pregnant by a junk, junkie. And neither the junkie nor the daughter was mature enough or responsible enough to raise the child, and so they had this child who was sick, sickly because of the parents, that they were raising themselves. But he kept on insisting that he had no suffering in his life. I mean, the one thing to get through a lot of that stuff, you have to put a good face on all kinds of bad things, but it means that you're never really going to get down to the, the real reasons for why they're suffering. Their attitude is just, well, if you grin and bear it enough, then, then it's not suffering. But that's not really true. So the Buddha wanted someone who was honest and observant, who would admit when there was suffering, and observant enough to want to look around and see what was happening together with the suffering. What came when, what actions were you doing when there's suffering? What things do you stop doing when suffering stops? This is what you've got to see. It's all something that's right here, directly in your own experience. Now, the formal term for this in Western philosophy is phenomenology, looking at your experience directly as experience, and not paying attention to what may or may not lie behind it. It's a big word, but it basically means looking directly right here, learning to be observant right here. And in some ways it seems to make your experience a little bit more two-dimensional. You're not trying to imagine the things behind it on either side, either things out there in the world that lie behind your experience of the senses or what's inside here, kind of behind your awareness. Just looking directly at the experience, these sensations right here, right now, this feeling of the breath, the, the bodily sensations. When the Buddha talks about form, this is what he's talking about, your sense of the body as felt from within. Earth, water, wind, and fire, these are all names for properties of solidity, liquidity, or coolness, energy, warmth. It's good to have this kind of vocabulary, because in the West we're very impoverished in our vocabulary about how you experience the body from within. That's form. And then there are the other aggregates. There's feeling, perception, fabrication, consciousness. It may seem like a strange way of dividing up the activities of the mind. We talked about this a little bit last night, but it's good to think about it some more. One of the main analogies the Buddha gives for how the mind acts is feeding. The mind feeds in the same way that the body feeds. There are a lot of similarities there. But one of the primary things you want to look at is that the extent to which your awareness is not passive, it's active. You're out looking for things. The Buddha's main analogy for causality is feeding. And these aggregates basically talk about the way the mind goes about feeding. First there's the feeling, the sense of a lack on the one hand, and then there's a hope for a feeling of fullness and pleasure that comes when you've fed properly on something. There's perception. Again, the perception of precisely what the lack is inside and then what you're going to try to look for to feed on outside. What's edible, what's not edible. What's right or not right for that particular hunger. Is fabrication your plans for how you're going to go about eating. And then when you find something, like with any kind of food, you get an egg. You can't just eat the egg. You've got to figure out what to do with it. Crack the shell, get the contents out, and then what do you do with them? You cook them. That's fabrication. And then consciousness is your awareness of these things. And 
And this applies not only to eating physical food, but also to your emotional food. You feel a need for some sort of companionship, and so you look around. What companionship is going to give you that pleasure? And you have certain perceptions about what your, your needs are. You look at those personal ads. Say, I'd like such and such a person. Then there's your fabrication, all the stories you create about what's going to happen when you find this ideal person. Then usually when you find somebody who may, to some extent, meet those requirements, or your ideas about what your requirements are, then you're going to change the person so that the person tries, you try to fit that person into your needs. And then, of course, there's the awareness of all this going on. And a lot of relationships are just this, each person trying to change the other person. And as long as there's a sense of that both sides are feeding and getting something out of it, the relationship lasts. But then there are relationships, of course, where the feeding is unhealthy, or one side is getting all the nourishment and the other side is not getting any nourishment at all. Those relationships are disastrous. And especially when you get the sense that you're not gaining anything out of the relationship, the other person is just feeding off of you, you begin to realize how oppressive it is to be fed on. But the, what the Buddha wants us to look at is that just the fact the need to feed, the process of feeding itself, is stressful. We're chanting just now the, the Dhamma Jaka, the Buddha's very first sermon. He talks about clinging to the five aggregates as being in the essence of suffering. Well, the word for clinging is feeding. So not only do we have these activities that revolve around feeding, we actually feed off those activities. There are many layers of feeding going on here. We like feelings so much that we hold on to them. The perceptions, the fabrications, all these other activities that have to go on around feeding, we feed off those activities on another level. And that's why we suffer. Because there's this felt need of got to feed all the time. So the Buddha wants you to look directly at this as you experience it. Because it's neat to feed. Even when you've got a good source of food, you know it's not going to last forever. And this, so there's a constant sense of lack, there's a constant sense of instability. And as long as the mind has these needs, or cannot get to a point where it no longer has these needs, it's going to suffer. This is what the training is all about, is getting the mind in a position where it finds something, a happiness that doesn't require feeding. That's why when the Buddha was looking for the solution to his problem, the solution of suffering, he knew he had to find this something that was deathless, that was free from conditions that would never end. And as he discovered, it had to be an experience outside of space and time. That too can be directly experienced. He talks about touching the deathless with the body, and it's not like it's a physical contact like heat or cold. There's a sense of coolness that goes along with it, but it's primarily the fact that you're going to experience it right here, right here where you're sensing your body right now, at this very direct level of experience. So this is where you look. You want to really get very familiar with this territory. Notice how within this territory there is this felt sense that you need to feed. And you look for what you can develop within this direct experience, what qualities you can develop that the mind gets really strong. The conviction, persistence, mindfulness, concentration, discernment. The things settle down, and you can see precisely how the mind is feeding as it goes from one moment to the next, to the next, to the next. I mean, you can isolate that activity and see that it's inherently stressful. You develop dispassion for it and just drop it. 
That's when you open up to the happiness that doesn't require any feeding. So everything we're looking for is right here. The problem is right here. The solution to the problem is also right here. And it's learning how to look at things right here honestly and use your powers of observation in ways that are going to stretch them a great deal. That's how we find the end of suffering right here. <laughs>